Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Okay, welcome back to our study group on the Philokalia. And uh, tonight we'll be looking at a very important theme or aspect of the Father's teaching uh, about the noose, which is often translated uh, in some unfortunate ways that makes it a little bit more confusing to understand what they, what they mean, often translated mind or intellect. Uh, but the translators of the Philokalia tell us right from the beginning that it's not the best translation because there is no real English translation that captures the meaning of this for us. Uh, but what we're going to try to understand here tonight is, is basically the Father's anthropology, how they understood the human person and the, the makeup of the human person and uh, the impact that this has on us spiritually, how it is that we are to address these various aspects of who we are as human beings. This is probably the most challenging uh, uh, evening for us, and it's certainly been the most challenging uh, aspect of their teaching for me to understand o over the years. And there have been a couple of resources that have been very helpful. Uh, among the Orthodox in, in particular, there is this understanding of, of the church as a hospital, and uh, it's through the liturgical life, through the spiritual life, prayer, that uh, we know healing uh, of soul. And uh, there's been one book in, in particular that's been very helpful in understanding uh, some of their writings. It's called Orthodox Psychotherapy. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. Herothios Vlakos, uh, a bishop, an Orthodox bishop. And uh, it's a magnificent little book subtitled The Science of the Fathers. And he translates psychotherapy in an interesting way. He said the more accurate translation is actually healing of soul. We often think of psychotherapy of dealing simply with what's going on in our, our mind. But uh, he says the more accurate understanding takes into consideration the whole person and most especially the, the spiritual life. And so he approaches the writings of the fathers really in light of this sense of the healing of of the whole person, but in particular the healing of, of the soul, the sickness of the soul that comes to us through the fall and through our, our sin. And uh, he treats uh, the, the noose in a very detailed way uh, in the text, and I put, printed out a copy here for, for you tonight. We're not going to go through it. It's just for some additional reading. Uh, it's a little bit more detailed and challenging to follow, but he was the first one that I think that helped me uh, to get a better grasp of what it is that they are, are teaching. He all wrote, also wrote a little book called The Illness and Cure of the Soul, and it's more of an interview between he and uh, another priest where they're talking uh, about this in particular. So it's a little easier to follow than, than the orthodox psychotherapy, but both, both very good text. Uh, I also want to introduce you to there are only two volumes of this that have been produced so far. It's called Themes of the Philokalia. And uh, the first one was, I believe, on watchfulness, and this one was on the noose. And uh, very well, very well done. And it uh, lays things out very clearly. And uh, unfortunately, they only have two of these put together. So it would have been more helpful, I think, to use this than the book that we're currently using if they had gotten further along, but we'll have to uh, make our way through through it ourselves with the other themes. But uh, this one will be in particular helpful tonight, and that's the larger handout that, uh, that I gave you that uh, the first page says preface on it. And uh, the third handout is simply from my blog, uh, and it has the picture of the helmsman there. And the, the noose is often called the helmsman of the soul or the rudder of the soul. And uh, so you could read that on your own if you're interested as well. And then finally, uh, again, the glossary from the Philokalia, which is most helpful. I think when we're going through these readings, even to have that on hand, uh, to be able to look up some of the words that they're using. <coughs> It's not that there's an uh, inconsistency, I think, with our, our tradition in regards to an understanding of the spiritual life. It's just that the language is so different, which then leads to a, a different approach to the spiritual life and a different articulation of that spiritual path. And 
uh, certainly read a lot from the Western tradition too, and John of the Cross, his view of the human person, and his view of the spiritual life, much different language that's used, and understanding of how the person is made up, you know, the different faculties of the soul, and he articulates it in a much different way, but certainly consistent with what we'll be talking about here in the, the weeks and months to come. It's just we have to get used to the fact that uh, different language is used, and and so a different way of articulating that has, has arisen over, over the generations. And so we'll have to struggle the best that we can, I think, to enter into to this, again, humbly, and you know, trying to allow ourselves to follow along and, and to you know, be guided by their teaching as much as we can, and even while we're looking at it critically, thinking about it critically. What I want to use here this evening is actually, I want to move away from Conieris' text, The Beginner's Introduction to the Philokalia. He only gives us two pages on the news, and uh, I just, it was very well written, but I didn't think it was going to take us far enough. And uh, so I, I want to use with you, and we might actually spend a couple of weeks on this concept, because it, I think it is central to their understanding, certainly of the human person, but also the, the spiritual life. And so I'd like to, I'll try to get some additional copies of this work if I can, if it's still available. But I did produce a, a photocopy of just the first couple of chapters for us to take a look at here this evening. Wonderful examples, very clearly written the best thing I found so far uh, on the noose. And uh, so hopefully by the time we get through it, we'll have a greater clarity. And I think while they go through describing exactly what, what it is, uh, they also bring up some other themes and concepts in the writings uh, of the fathers that will be very helpful for us uh, as we go through the rest of Conieris' text. So I want to begin here with the, the preface and then make our way through as much as we can tonight. I know it's an awfully long handout, and if we don't make it all the way through, that's fine. Okay. Any questions that anyone has here before we get started or anything from last time that you'd like to reconsider? Okay. Well, we begin here with the preface. Man, the superior creation of God, the pinnacle of creation is composed of matter and spirit, body and soul, he is surpassing from the material to the immaterial, from the perceptive to the non-perceptive world, is achieved with the power of the soul, the noose. And I want you to take a look there at just the, the first footnote, and the first footnote comes to us from the Philokalia from the glossary, and so from the authors, the translators of the text itself. And I think it's worthwhile our just taking a moment to, to look it over. Uh, it's considered the highest faculty in man, through which, provided it is purified, he knows God or the inner essences or principles of created things by means of direct apprehension or spiritual perception. The noose does not function by formulating abstract concepts and then arguing on this basis to a conclusion reached through deductive reasoning, but it understands divine truth by means of immediate experience, intuition, or simple cognition. So it, it's a kind of, of, it's a faculty that brings us to a kind of knowing of both worldly realities in terms of being able to uh, address the, their worth, where they come from, their value, whether there's something to be embraced or avoided, but also spiritual realities too. But it's a simple, con, uh, as he says, cognition that we would see or perceive the truth, but it's not necessarily through our deductive reasoning. We aren't thinking it through in regards to various concepts. So it's a perception of the truth. Uh, John the Cross uh, talks about this a little bit in regards to faith, that he, he considers a faith a dark, obscure knowing. It's kind of understanding, knowledge of God, and yet dark and obscure. It's something that's perhaps beyond our, our intellect, and yet we perceive the, the tru truth of it. And, and I think they're getting to sort of the same thing here with the understanding of the noose. It's something that's greater than intellect in the way that we would understand, and deeper than emotion. So it's a perception of the far great, greater realities 
of life, material and immaterial. And it can lead us in one direction or another. If it's distorted through our sin, then our perception of these realities will be distorted and will be led into the deeper darkness. But if it's purified through the ascetical life, through, through prayer, through the sacramental life, then it draws us into a, a deeper knowledge and love of God and also, also purity. Um, a question uh, from this book, mm-hmm. all this with that. Um, is the news, do, does the, do the fathers understand the news that something that man is endowed with naturally or uh, through baptism? Because in these two short pages, they make reference to, he says specifically, the control switch, the hegemonicon, is the mind of Christ, which we receive when we put on Christ in holy baptism. Mm-hmm. So is the news natural or... Um, well, it's, that's a good question, and I, I think when, when I've read through, and maybe some others in the room can add their thoughts about this, there, it seems like there are variant teachings and understandings of what the noose is, and whether it is something natural or, or God-given, but my understanding of it is that it's a, a natural part of who we are, it's part of our, one of our faculties as human beings, that we're made in the image and likeness of God, who is noose, word, and spirit. And we also, as made in his image, are noose, word, and spirit in our own way as a reflection of God. What, through our baptism, you know, that noose is, is purified and perfected, and yet we distort it again by stepping into our, our sin. It was darkened for us once, once again. And so the ascetical life is a means to purify that eye of the soul, the eye of the heart, they would often say, in order that we might be able to perceive those spiritualities with greater, or those spiritual realities with a greater clarity. So could I rephrase, would it be better to rephrase the question, maybe to offer a third option, that is, that it's, um, there's been, I, I, because I was in a sense juxtaposing the natural and the supernatural, mm-hmm. But it could also be um, a natural something with which man is naturally endowed that can be supernaturalized or elevated, right. perfected by grace. Grace, right? Yeah, that's my understanding. Maria, did you have something? I was going to say it seems like maybe that belief in the human person where we have the capacity for God it's something natural with the, that point where we have the capacity for the supernatural. This book on the Jesus prayer, do you remember that this book is from Frederica Matthews Green? Mm-hmm. It, it has this interesting couple paragraphs on the news. Do you mind if I... Well, actually, it was sent, the link was sent to me today yeah. by Father Ivan. And I, I'd, I'd say yes, but we have su- such limited time. But it, it, are you just talking one paragraph? Yeah, paragraph. Okay. It says here, because um, she said she read through a lengthy book and she wrote down the definition and she had six definitions. And she said, but I gradually seen, came to see that the kind of mind intended by news primarily indicates the receptive faculty of the mind, what we might call the understanding. For example, if Jesus understood, for example, Jesus opened their noose to understand the scriptures. This is the part of mind that engages directly with life, which comprehends and take, takes things in. What's more, it is a perceptive faculty capable of recognizing truth, as you said, not in the sense of arriving at a logical conclusion at the end of an argument. Instead, it perceives truth in a direct, intuitive way, when you hear the ring of truth, it is your noose that does the resonating. And later on, she ties it to con- conscience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I often thought that when reading through this, and Father Drew did his dissertation on conscience, Newman's view of conscience, and it does sound an awful lot of that, especially this simple cognition. But I don't want to get too too far, or even just wrapped up in the definitions at this point. I think the wonderful thing about this book is that it does lead us through it step by step in such a way, and seeing how the noose functions. And I think looking at its functionality Uh, is one way for us to have a a greater understanding of it. So why don't we try to jump back to the text here and make our way through at least a little bit. The foundation of the faith of our Orthodox Church is that man constitutes the image of the triune God. The triune God is nous, Father, Word, Son, and Spirit. The nous without beginning did bear the word mystically and emanated the Holy Spirit of the same power, 
we, we, we therefore confess the master God of all consubstantial trinity. And so basically what the authors are saying is that made in the image and likeness of God, there's a reflection of that reality within us in regards to our makeup as human beings, our, our faculties. And if, if this is uh, more confusing than helpful at the moment, don't worry about it. I think as we move our way through it, we'll be able to unpack it a little bit. Man is also a triune image of God. He is also a noose word in spirit. Man's exceptionally, exceptional nobility lies in this triune creation, that God created man by infinite divine love in his image and made him God by grace in his likeness. It is from this nobility that the incomparable difference between animal and man can be seen. Even though the soul is one, it is divided according to the Holy Fathers into three powers or three parts, the intelligent, the appetitive, and the insensitive. The tool by which the intelligent part operates is the noose. So the intelligent part or the intelligent faculty then, uh, it's, it would be apprehending that which would apprehend spiritual realities within us. It's operative action. And so the noose would fall under this, under this category. It's how we perceive that we have this cognition understanding of these spiritual realities. The appetitive would have more to do with our, as the word seems to indicate, our appetites, our, our bodily desires. And then the insensitive is, is interesting. It's sort of the, the, the faculty that's associated with vehement feeling or vehement emotion. You hear it in the word in, incensed, the insensitive power, so anger, wrath, are often things that are associated with this particular faculty. And again, these faculties can lead to the good or to the bad. That the insensitive power, for example, is often very important in the spiritual battle, that we would have a hatred, as it were, for sin within us. And so when we see it rise up within us or a temptation comes upon us, it would be that insensitive faculty that would then motivate us to, to, to strike it down or to cut it out of our lives. But the insensitive power, if it isn't formed by grace or if it's been distorted in some way, can be directed towards others. We can see other people's faults and lash out at them with a, a kind of anger, look for chinks in the armor and look for ways to criticize them. And so all of these faculties have to be formed and shaped by the grace of God and also the ascetical life. So it's a, a very beautiful, I think, uh, simple and clear, I think when we, we step into it, vision of the human person, but also the, the faculties uh, of the soul. And we'll, we'll see that when we actually get into their writings about the ascetical life the, the, the clarity and, that it does have and, and, and hopefully more than just uh, our approach of it from the, on the level of definition. Here's a good example. Someone asked a hermit, Elder, what is the noose? With distinctive simplicity, the hermit replied, Well, if the helmsman of a ship is missing, what do you think? Will it reach the harbor? The waves will destroy it. It is the same with the noose. It is the helmsman. So the noose is the faculty in the spiritual life that allows us to, to guide our way through the, the, the spiritual life, to be able to discern correctly and cl with clarity what comes from God, what comes from ourselves, or what comes from, from the devil. And so to make our way through the rough seas, as, as it were, of the, of the spiritual life. And so the image is a, a very good one. And the title of Connie Harris' chapter, our chapter is Hegemenicon, I believe I'm pronouncing that correct, correctly, uh, the, the helmsman of the soul. According to St. Gregory Palamas, the intellectual activity consisting of thought and intuition is called noose, and the power that activates thought and intuition is likewise the noose, and this power the Holy Scripture also calls the heart. It is because the heart is the preeminent among our powers that our soul is deiform. This is where it gets a little bit confusing, and I think looking at your glossary uh, can be helpful too, because they will often use words interchangeably, and uh, they'll use intellect, mind, heart, 
I have the heart, I have the mind, I have the soul. And so it can become a little confusing at, at times. And uh, I think that's okay. I think we just have to understand that they're often, often using these words interchangeably. The, the heart would be more than obviously the internal organ for us. It would re really be the center of, of the whole person, you know, body, soul, and, and spirit. And so it becomes the image, the preeminent image for us. Uh, th through and in which the, the spiritual life I is lived and, and in which these faculties are activated. And so I, I think at least for the moment, if we can sort of hold on to that image of, of the heart, we'll come back to it again and be able to look at it hopefully with a greater clarity. The noose is also the ability to partake and unite with God. Elsewhere it is called the capability of theoria, or vision of God. It is exactly the same thing. For one to see God is to be united with God. That is why according to patristic terminology it is called the eye of the soul, noetic eye or theoretic eye or rational part of the soul. So blessed are the pure of heart, they shall see God. And so as the eye of, of the heart, the eye of the soul is purified, so the, does our capacity grow then to have this clear vision of God, to see God as he is in himself. And so this is why we see this as a central principle, central goal within their, their, their spiritual writings, that we want to purify this eye of the heart, eye of the soul as much as possible so that we could come to this ultimate goal, theosis, and then also which would be deification that would allow also for this vi greater vision of God and union with him. Okay. Anything anyone would like to add or, or questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, um, I was always intrigued by that whole thing. You know how St. Paul says man is spirit, soul, and body. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole debate what, what exactly that means. Mm -hmm. Is it... Big S spirit, smaller spirit, some say it's kind of both. I'm, I'm just reading this paragraph here, the one that begins according to St. Gregory Palamas. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I can see where the confusion may have, because they're probably trying to work it out themselves. They are, and I, I think that's what we have to understand, you know, that to the, the desert's like a laboratory, as it were, <coughs> and as they enter into the... Uh, aesthetical life and come to understand the inner workings of the mind and the heart. They're trying to ar articulate it, give it language. And so we are going to find, I, I think, some inconsistency there, or variance, one might be the, the better word to use. And there was an article I was reading this morning that was saying that it doesn't fit, certainly, it's a much different use of the word than the Greek philosophers would have used, what we find within, even within scripture. And so, and then what we find in the writings of the fathers is a different sort of understanding or meaning that they give to to the word. And so, I think we have to be aware of that and understand that okay, it's not not going to fit exactly here with how we understand or when we've you know done our studies about certain passages from scriptures, and that we might even find you know variance among the fathers in terms of how they're describing the news. And I think it's our job to sort of sit back and take in what they're all teaching. And the nice thing about these, these books on the themes of, of the Philokalia is that the last part of the book is selections from all the different fathers that really does give you a sense of how each of them uh, approach the, the various themes. Who publishes that? Uh, it's the Holy Monastery of St. Gregory Palamas and Thessalonica, and uh, it was published, this volume was published in 1999, and as far as I know, there's only been two volumes published so far, but a, a wonderful resource, and as you see, very readable, very readable, and certainly the most readable that i found. Okay, anything else before we move on? Okay. The man, man is an image of God because he has a noose. The noose of man is a creative factor of every aspect of civilization. It is tragic, however, when the rational and discerning sense is missing from the noose. It is then blinded, 
completely outside itself, as we, as we shall see, and forms absolute relationships with creation and its sensory nature, through its, though its essence is noetic. It swims in a sea of arrogance and vainglory. It ceases to be noose in activity, and it becomes only noose in spiritual physical activity. That is, it becomes irrational. It becomes like those lifeless electronic computers which it creates, like artificial flowers without fragrance, like blind machines. And so I thought it was interesting, you know, saying that it's, <laughs> it's um, a creative factor for every aspect of civilization, the, this faculty of, of the soul that does give us this perception of reality then does give rise to our ability to understand the world within which we live and understand ourselves as human beings. But distorted by sin, it could do actually the opposite, make us less than what we are meant to be. And it can make the things of creation itself and those things that we've made are, are idols, basically. that They become the focus of worship for us or the focus of the news. So it's functioning on a much lower level than what it should be, or it should be opening us up to a greater vision of God. What it's doing is making us focus on the things of the world and making them the center of our lives. So we become centered on something that's lifeless, technology, and we come to worship it as something that brings us joy and peace in our life. And I think we see that, we can see that pretty easily in our own lives. We're fascinated by technology, you know, this uh, virtual life, if you will, that we've created for ourselves and we use it to enter entertain us, but it, it becomes a distraction for us from God, you know, certainly nothing, not something that leads us to God. And so that this is why the ascetical life becomes so important, that we continually draw ourselves back to where we need to be and to, to have this rem constant remembrance uh, of God. The noose of man, according to a contemporary ascetic, is similar to a bird in the sky, at times flying high, at other times low. On the one hand, the fathers of the Philoclea are occupied with the ascension and raising of the noose, and on the other with its falls to the lower parts of the earth as a result of the passions. So in their writings, we find both. You know, they focus on when the news has been distorted by our, our sinfulness, how our, our passions begin to take over. Uh, but they also focus on when the news has been purified and what that offers us in regards to our experience of God. This next paragraph is sort of interesting. It focuses on uh, that the, it is possible to reproduce a certain part of this experience uh, on a natural level for us. And the authors use the example of, of yoga and the meditation associated with yoga. And I want to see what you think of this. Meditation or the collecting of the noose for those who are involved with yoga, a non-Christian Eastern religion, may be achieved, but it is stagnant and fruitless. The noose remains only within with the methodology. Up to this point, it may be considered as a praiseworthy attempt achieved, however, only through human effort, and for this reason condemned from the beginning. The new stops in the middle of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and falls who, falls who among thieves strip him of his raiment and wound him and depart, leaving him half dead. This occurs because the noose does not have an object. It seeks a non-existent enlightenment, and it becomes deluded since in reality it unites with a demon which manages to present falsehood as truth and truth as falsehood, transforming into an angel of light. And so it, it's an interesting idea. So on a natural level, we can bring our focus, as it were, in upon our, our noose, in upon this faculty that we have, and move towards this kind of inner, inner simplicity. But where the real danger is, is that it has no object. It might bring a kind of peace of mind, uh, but if not directed towards its proper object, if not uh, directed towards God, it can leave us 
either vulnerable to other spirits or simply lead us nowhere to a false kind of, of enlightenment. Is that what is meant by um, noose in spiritual, physical activity? Right, that it's just it's functioning simply on the material level. And so I think that's why people are often attracted to it. They see, oh, okay, I see the same thing taking place here, and it's certainly easier than embracing the, the gospel and all of its moral demands. So I'll seek out a certain aspect of the spiritual practice that is satisfying and fulfilling on a certain level, which, which it is, but there isn't the, the object that then calls us to what we are meant to be in his image and likeness calls us to the fullness of life. And so ultimately it becomes self-centered, self-absorbed. It lacks that circular motion, which we'll talk about in a, in a later chapter, where the focus on the, the noose within, the kingdom of God within, leads us back to God. And so there, the motion here for us, the energy, as it were, is self, you know, entering into the self through prayer, ascetical activity, to, to the inner kingdom that leads us to God, whereas the, the practice of something like yoga is, you know, it's, there's a, a sterility in it, ultimately. Uh, but it, I think it becomes seductive for a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, for that kind of inner peace that it seems to bring. Any thoughts or questions about that? Will, will we talk later, uh, if at all, about how the sacraments impact? I mean, when you were talking about yoga, and then really kind of any new age activity, well, it's I think our, our effort will be to do that. When we look at the writings of the, the Philoclea, there's a lot that is assumed that these teachings are being read and one would seek to embrace them within the context of the life of the church. That outside of that reality, the sacramental life of the church, the divine liturgy, you know, the ascetical life, it makes, makes no sense. But you don't find within the Philoclea frequent references to the, the sacramental, sacramental life. And it's not because they think it's un, unimportant, it's because it's an assumed reality. And I think that's important for us to, to keep in mind. That outside of the life of grace, that it is impossible to live what they are teaching here. And that is, that is something that they do make clear over and over again. Okay. Yes. Maybe a slightly provocative question? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't want to focus on yoga, but more on the activity and what's going on with the noose in yoga. So would he, or would the fathers argue that the kind of activity or the way that the noose is engaged in yoga is actually a dangerous thing or a harmful thing for the noose. Well, or that it would... can be something neutral that one could engage in as long as one understood that one has to take it a step beyond. It could be neutral, but I think they would say that it would open one to certain vulnerabilities, sort of the gospel <laughs> passage. I think we've mentioned it here before, where one... Uh, sweeps out the house, a demon is cast out, but then seven others come, and the, the state of that soul is far worse than, than in the beginning. And I think that could be true with something like this, that we can be opening ourselves in such a way that we make ourselves vulnerable, not to the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit, but rather to demonic spirits. And, and so unless you're engaged in this spiritual warfare and gu guarding the heart, taking every thought captive, then you are ultimately going to become more vulnerable. Because if, if you are focusing on, on the noose in this way, you know, you are, in a sense, o opening your, yourself. You're creating that, that inner experience, but without its proper object. So what, what's going to fill that void? the things of the world or, you know, demonic spirits. And so I, I think that's why they speak so strongly mm -hmm. here, because one would make oneself vulnerable. And it's, uh, it's true not only for yoga, I think it's for a lot of other 
you know, spiritual experiences that people seek to embrace, or in, in the New Age movement kind of thing. You know, spirituality without morality. You know, spirituality without religion. And uh, you know, I think the same thing happens there. Okay. We'll move on to the next chapter here because we begin to. Uh, look at how the fall of the noose and you know what that looks like for us and I think it's here that we begin to understand things with a, a little bit more clarity that final little paragraph there they ask us to pray for for the those who have written this text whereas I think we actually have to ask them to pray for us as we go through it the ability of the noose of man is to see God to see God is not only its principle and higher ability, but it is also its central aim for which it was created by God. And this we already mentioned, to see God, this is the central aim uh, of the spiritual life and the purification of, of the noose. This, say the Holy Fathers, was exactly the blessedness of Adam and Eve in paradise, to see the omniscient, delightful, and most longed for face of their visible and invisible, their approachable and unapproachable creator. God himself is not only the invisible and inaccessible essence of God, he is also the uncreated, accessible, divine energies. So the, the Adam and Eve live in this state of receptivity, uh, uh, as it were, uh, natural God-given capacity to ex experience and encounter God, to see, to look upon the face of God. We said that the noose constitutes the eye of the soul. Its function, however, is different from the bodily eye. Even though the bodily eye sees all visible things, it cannot see itself. The noose, however, operates with three movements, the direct, the circular, and the spiral. It can also return to itself to see even its own self. And this, this I found very, very helpful and very interesting, this, these three distinctions here. Let us simply look at what St. Dionysus means when he talks about the movements of the noose. With the direct movement, the noose of man sees things and faces with perceptions or images or symbols which are created in the imagination or with different conceptions which the mind shapes. Since our noose remains still, with its direct movement, it makes the noose perceptible, or sensual, or miserly, or pretentious, or flesh-worshipping, or technological, or crass, or bestial, or evil. For example, the mind sees the creations of God, a man, a woman, and it is captured. It sees money and succumbs to it. It sees the technical aspect of a machine, and it is enslaved by it, and it becomes submissive. To that thing by which the senses are subjected, subjected, and so the direct perception of the noose. It simply sees these realities and, as it were, is is drawn into them. The immediate attraction takes over or takes hold of them. They are taken captive by what the the noose perceives, and so certainly this would be the most problematic action of the, of the noose for us. The direct movement of our news finally takes away its natural beauty and transforms it to a mundane and earthly news since it becomes attached and assimilates with the ugliness of the passions. The Truparia of the second ode of the great canon describes this poetically. With the lust of passion I have darkened the beauty of my soul and turned my whole mind entirely into dust. With my lustful desires, I have formed within myself the deformity of the passions and disfigured the beauty of the mind. What is the beauty of the mind? It is the first created grace with which the Creator beautified man. It is the reflection of the divine beauty and the glory of the person of God. And so we, you know, by being caught up in the things of this world and our attachment to them, we become less than what God has created us to be. And we aren't able to see God as he is in himself. We're unable to see the beauty, beauty of God that most and even perhaps many of those who call themselves Christian have, have never tasted the beauty 
of God, never perceived the beauty of God, because there isn't the uh, ascetical life, the, the prayer life, the purification of the noose that would, that would support that. In paradise, Adam and Eve were bestowed with a noose which saw God, not always, though, with the circular movement, but with the third, which is called the spiral movement. The circular movement of the noose is this. When the noose returns to itself, it finds heaven, of which the Lord says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. This energy is superior, and with it, the noose overcomes and surpasses itself, or uses itself as a stepping stone in order to reach union and theoria and the vision of God through the energies of God. And so this is what we were speaking about earlier, this kind of circular movement. The kingdom of God is within you. And so when the focus become, is on the noose with, within, the presence of, God, presence of God within, then there's a lifting up that takes place in the experience of God in and through the noose as well. So the circular movement takes place in our day-to-day -day life as we are, are being purified. And so this is what we would this is what we would see. The circular movement of the news is fixed and it does not easily fall into error or deception of the devil. On the contrary, the news becomes ensnared with the spiral movement. This is the third movement between direct and circular. With the spiral movement of the news, Adam and Eve saw God in creation and they glorified him. The evil one, however, set his trap and drew the noose from the creator to creation, to the fruit of the tree, and made them turn away from the creator and forget his commandment. The fall of the noose of man before Christ was an idolatrous fall, starting from the spiral and ending up with the direct movement, a drift and turning towards creation. The hymnographer St. Andrew of Crete writes poetically, I looked upon the beauty of the tree, and my mind was deceived, and now I lie naked and ashamed. A beautiful thought. So they have this vision uh, of God, this perception of God, but they are, are seduced uh, to take their eyes, or the eye of the soul, as it were, off of the Creator and place it onto creation. That somehow there would be something that would be greater than God, greater than the beauty uh, of God, and that would be found somewhere within creation. Eat of the fruit of the tree, and your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. You will see good and evil for yourself, and they succumb to the illusion. Somehow outside of God, or by making themselves God, they would see and perceive things with a true clarity. And it's interesting, the moment that they embrace the illusion is the moment that they lose capacity over their own faculties. They became, uh, become ashamed and seek to hide themselves. So they, they who would be gods can no longer control their own appetites. All of a sudden they see each other in an objective kind of fashion and they... They, they know their lustfulness or they know their nakedness and so they seek to, to cover that up. They become ashamed where before there was no, no reason for it. Okay. So a, a very helpful, I think, means to understand the, the, the workings and the functioning of the noose and how it can be distorted. Any thoughts or questions? I know that's a, a lot to throw at you at the moment. Mm -hmm. So he's almost saying... Um, a noose gone wrong is a noose that's entirely directed outwards, always going out to things, creation, whereas the circular <coughs> is kind of the noose coming into itself again, mm -hmm. almost like protect, pr it's kind of like, is it Aristotle, know, know thyself, it's almost like that in action, mm -hmm. and then the spiral is like what was happening to, to kind of break that circle. And the, you know, we can be seduced out of it, yeah. seduced out of that circular motion between self and God, out of the relational aspect, and then spiral down into the point that it becomes that direct movement of the noose. So is spiral always uh, a negative movement of the noose? Well, it's a vulnerable movement. 
I think, of the news, that we can become focused, I think, upon the things uh, of creation. And so we'll get to this as we get further along, even in this little text, that the, the ideal that they saw was to purify the news and to remain within that circular movement, that we wouldn't be turning to the, the things of this world in the sense that we would become attached to them. Right, because it seems as though, maybe I'm hearing it wrong, it seems as though the, the direct movement of the news is to be avoided. Mm -hmm. The circular movement is to be embraced, mm -hmm. and the spiral is also to be... Yeah, it's like the in-between part, you know, when mm -hmm. we're giving ourselves over and entertaining perhaps the this, this seduction that then leads to the spiral and then finally to the fall again, the darkening of the noose where it's, it no longer is, you know, perceptive, perceives God, but is focused entirely upon the material, material world. So you wouldn't call this spiritual warfare in, in a sense? Yeah. It is. I would, yeah. It's, 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 the heart of, it's at the heart of the spiritual warfare, warfare, and that's why they give it such attention that when the news is purified, um, last week I think we talked about uh, the development of a sense of discernment or a sense of taste in the spiritual life almost, that we're able, the, the news is able to perceive with a greater clarity that which comes from God, ourself, or, or from the devil. And so the more that the news is purified, the greater that perception is and the greater, the more quickly it can enter into that battle, discern you know, which is, which is coming from the devil and seek to cut it away through the ascetical life, through the, the Jesus prayer, and through all the other means that they, they describe for us. Is it the news that enables the watchfulness that we talked about last week? That kind of isn't the mind being watchful itself, but rather the soul, the eye of the soul kind of keeping guard rather than just the... Right. Yeah, it is the, it is the guard for us, you know, that we, we are called to be watchful, but the noose is the means through which we are able to do that. Okay. Where are we here? Yes. Um, how do we distinguish the, the circular movement of the noose from a kind of self-worship? Well, Good question. I think the the circular movement would always have that movement back towards God. That I, I think where we would actually see the the self centeredness would be with the direct. Mm -hmm. That we become focused on others or on our, ourselves. That the the circular one is always leading us back to God. So we, what we are engaging internally is God within the the kingdom of God within the grace that he has given us, the presence of God within us, and that leads us then to direct our, our minds and our, our hearts towards him. And so the movement sort of feeds on itself, whereas with the direct mm -hmm. is, I think, where the focus becomes stuck on our ourselves in a materialistic kind of way or self-worshipping kind of way. And they described it at the top of that, what it looks like at the top of the previous page. They're on the top of 14 miserly, pretentious, flesh-worshipping, technological or crass, bestial and evil. The mind sees the creations of God and it is captured. And so part of that cre creation would be our, ourselves and what we are doing and the things in our life. And so we get so caught up in that that God slips out of the picture. Okay, why don't we... Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's the, the direct and the circular that seem to be the extremes to me, and the spiral sort of in the middle that leads to then the fall, to the darkening. Okay, but uh, with the coming of the Creator of to the world, with the holy mystery of baptism, as many as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. And as many have put on Christ, have also put on the mind of Christ on that joyous day. But volition, sin, passions, and the devil darken and pollute the noose, 
and turn it from the immortal and eternal creator to perishable and transient creation. St. Macarius of Egypt says that after the transgression, the noose of man became like the birds which can only fly a few meters and at a minimal height above the ground. Some brothers once asked Abbas Silwan, what kind of life did you lead? What struggles have you pursued so as to receive this wisdom? And he replied, never did I leave a thought in my heart that would offend God. The noose that is pure and does not offend God is similar to an eye that does not even accept the smallest dust particle. It is from the noose that all the powers of the soul depend. That is why the Lord tells us, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be filled, shall be full of darkness. And so last week, remember, our, we were talking about the relentlessness of, of the battle. The, the temptations are relentless. The devil is relentless in the, in the, the desire to distort the noose, to lead us into sin. And so the, the battle that we wage with the aid of the noose is to be relentless. So we, our love for, for God is so great that our asceticism is to take thought, to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Or as is said here, that an eye, comparing it to an eye that doesn't accept one particle of dust. And you think about it, that we expose our minds and our hearts to all kinds of things and without any awareness of all or we minimize the significance of it. But I think when we look at the writings of the fathers, they're telling us just the opposite, that this is, this is our work. This is our full-time occupation. Our greatest desire should be not to let any sin enter into our heart and that we should desire this purity of heart or the purity of the noose in such a way that we're able to perceive those spirituality, those spiritual realities with a, a greater clarity. And so it's not a, a scrupulosity. It's rooted rather than in this love and desire for God that we would want, not want any element of sin or sinful thought to enter within, that we would seek to keep the temple of God, which we are, pure and for him alone. And I think our world is... You know, it's gone in the complete opposite direction. The more that you can expose yourself to, the better. And if you think of the use of computers, I mean, we are constantly exposing ourselves to constant stimulation or to television, to music, all these kind of things. And so what we find here is going to, I think, feel very foreign, even to very faithful Christians, because it is calling us to a kind of awareness of self, what's going on within the mind and in the heart, to have a constant remembrance of God, to seek to pray without ceasing, to take nothing lightly that comes along our, our path or make it, in, make it into nothing, that we have to sort of take our, our spiritual life and the impact that these things can have on our interior life seriously or we'll be, we'll be led into sin and we'll lose that capacity to judge between what is good and, and evil. And this isn't something to be taken lightly. Christ speaks of it in, in the gospel, that unforgivable sin. You know, when we are, you know, get to the point where we call good evil and call evil good, we lose then with that the capacity for true repentance. And with the loss of that capacity for repentance, how can we turn back to God and know the, the forgiveness that he desires? to give to us. And so if the news is so darkened and so distorted, this is, this is what can happen to us. We have a tendency, especially within the Western church, to make the idea of, of mortal sin uh, something that's infrequent, that nobody you know, falls into to mortal or sin or grave sin. But when, when you begin to you know, read something like this, you know, that distinction isn't all that helpful because I think it lets people off the hook in some way, at least in the way that they are understanding the spiritual life. Well, how far do I have to go before I fall into a serious sin? Whereas the spiritual tradition is saying there's no sin that we should allow ourselves and we shouldn't 
you know, think that, you know, entertaining ourselves a little bit with something that, as long as we don't cross a certain boundary, is okay. If we do that, we are in the process darkening the news, and then eventually we'll fall into sin. We're putting ourselves to the test when we do so. Right. That's right. How does this this thought, this action, glorify God? And if there's a question about it, how do I discern what to, what to do here? Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I find interesting when you talk about the circular movement of the Jews? Mm-hmm. In, the, in the monastic sense, their life is a circular movement all the time. The mm-hmm. daily cycle of services, the church calendar. Right. right. So that sort of would help them... Foster, right? Constantly return back. Right. The sanctifying of time and of the day itself. It it fosters this kind of constant remembrance of God, an unceasing return to Him, enter into one's work, labor, and into prayer. And then, you know, that movement takes place over and over again. Whereas, I think in the West in particular, we, you know, again, we become so focused upon the work, but it's separated from that relationship with God. And it becomes the thing that's, you know, our, our idol. You know, it, it rules. And we had mentioned this in an earlier group. You know, when you ask somebody how they're doing, the first word that you usually hear is busy. That they're engaged in these worldly labors. And spiritual life is pushed out to the margins and squeezed in when it can be, rather than being something that is part of this circular motion this ever-present reality that we're bringing ourselves back to over and over again. Uh, there's an interesting uh, video that's on YouTube, if you haven't had a chance to see it. It's called The Last Anchorite. And it's about this Father Lazarus who uh, lives uh, the life of a hermit near the monastery of St. Anthony. And uh, it's very well, well produced. But he, he talks about making the spiritual life you know, this, uh, uh, how does he describe it? Sort of uh, an adjunct kind of aspect of our, our life, you know, out on the margins. And he says, so long as you think about your prayer life in that way, it's, it's not going to bear any fruit f- for you. That it has to be the, the fundamental occupation for you and around which everything in your life revolves, so long as it's out at the, the margins, or uh, an auxiliary construction is the, the term that he uses. You know, it, it's something that we need in our life that has a certain kind of meaning for us, but it's not rooted in any kind of reality in terms of how we're, we're living our lives. It's intimately. Not in a morbid way, but, you know, yeah. in that way of, like, the beginning of my real life. Yeah. It's intimately connected. In fact, in a couple chapters ahead, we'll come to that when they're talking about uh, memories and recollections and how these are to be purified as well. And they talk specifically about the spiritual practice of the remembrance of death, especially when memories are deeply ingrained within us. And that the, the way to address that is through this constant remembrance of death, but also the, the, the consequences of death and sin, the, the punishment that is connected with that. And so often there would be, uh, within the lives of, of these fathers, this constant remembrance of death on a daily basis, but also uh, you know, some would keep a, a skull 
you know, close close at hand. If you've ever visited any of these monasteries, there are still places where, you know, they're very much visible, and so part of their life. You know, this reflection upon mor mortality. Our problem, I think, today is that we limit it to Ash Wednesday. You know, remember your dust, and then we put it push it out of our mind uh, the rest of the rest of the time. I just wanted to add that at our parish, we were asked a few years ago uh, by the, the hierarchy to institute this, this thing called Generations of Faith. Mm -hmm. And this was supposed to be a program that's supposed to try and teach the children and the adults together. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember how when we got to this whole topic of cycles, mm -hmm. the, the annual cycle, and the way they tried us to get to tell the children is to cut out three circles, one big one, one middle size one, and one little one, mm -hmm. and then what it would look like if you were rolling them on the same line, you'll see how they would, you know, one would be rolling faster, right. the other one was slower, and the other one takes a long time. You know? And I remember how uh, most of the resistance to what the program was trying to convey, this notion of cycles, and how the cycles work, and how you're supposed to become a part of the cycle. In other words, it was trying to get us to see that when we celebrate the feasts, when we celebrate the Vespers, the Matins, what we're doing is we're, we're honing our skills to be in tune with the cycle. And, and thereby, I, I think it was this uh, sentence here on page 17, mm -hmm. the noose of man away from the vision of the glory of God becomes demonic or bestial. Well, the cycles are trying to give us a way of participating in this vision of glory. Right. That's the practical reality. And I remember how the resistance came from people who kept saying, but Father, only six days are holy days of obligation, so what do I have to come to the other ones for? Right. <laughs> and it was such a, such a struggle to explain to somebody the value that this of is about the vision of God right. that you need to maintain right. so that your noose doesn't get darkened. Mm -hmm. And, and each feast has something to say about the love of God. Each feast has something to say about the faith that we're asked to embrace. Right. And then finally, each feast gives us a hope, which is the connection, why do you think of death? Because the hope is, well, what about the eschatology? What about the future? Right. So, so together, these cycles are meant to introduce us into this vision of God. And it was so difficult to get that point across to right. anybody who was stuck in this whole... Like, well, I already did my two hours at Mass. What do you want from me? I have to go back to my regular life. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, that's where it is, tre again, treating it as an auxiliary construction. Yeah. And to be attuned with the, the liturgical life of the, of, the, of the Church throughout the year, the feast and the, and the, and the holy seasons, I think does foster this, this sense for us. And so if you are going to daily Mass, you probably experience that in far greater measure than one who simply goes on s Sunday, or if you are uh, praying the divine office, and you, you're much more attuned to the, the, the particular feast days, the lives of the saints, all those all those things that would strengthen and encourage you, you know, in this in this spiritual life. Why don't we try to just finish up this one chapter? It's already a little after eight thirty, and uh, and then we'll pause for the evening. Where are we at here? I'm sorry, I've lost my. Top of, Top of 17. Okay, yes. Since the noose of the contemporary man has fallen into the same sin as Adam and Eve, it has turned toward creation with an unrestrainable, idolatrous, and evil disposition. In this way, the noose of man, uh, away from the vision of the glory of God, becomes either demonic or bestial. The noose which is overcome by the passions and egoism is unenlightened, dark, short-sighted and feeble. When the noose of contemporary man, using its creative abilities, turns away from itself with an unquenchable thirst for creation, with a madness for the continuous expansion of lifeless technology which has reached its zenith, it ignores or is indifferent to its own self as the divine image. Unconsciously, it seeks self-divinization, to become a deity, not from the fact that it is a noose which sees God, but a noose which sees creation and material things. Its superficial progress is deprived of the brilliance and theoria of the eternal light. 
this kind of inept news, demonic, blind, and rational, has driven man in our times to a new fall and self-exile from the paradise of Christ's holy church. The noose of man for a second time is tried by the temptation of self-divinization and yields over to a dark egocentricity and is lost in the paths of vain philosophy and deception, science without light, and drowns in a technology-bound sea without a rudder. For one more time, it forgets the road of its true deification. All goods and possessions, a world completely technological and scientific, would have been good and profitable if the noose of man remained in itself and through itself in the blessed state of being God by grace, able to see God. All would have been well if man had not disturbed the balance of the powers of the soul, if he had not suffered, and if he had a healthy noose. Just as the devil wore the mask of a serpent to deceive the first man back then, so now he wears the mask of technology and the so-called material civilization and drives man to a new exile, to a new unhappiness. Blessed is the contemporary man who, placing his trust in the Lord, is like a holy mountain, for it is never shaken by attacks of Belial. Blessed is whoever can say, the enemy no longer subjects me, deceiving me about my theosis because Christ, having deified human nature, has now, without any obstacles, opened to me the way to true life. So it's not a negative view of the intellectual life or a negative view of the world, but it does acknowledge the fact that you know, uh, a noose that has been distorted by our sin can make all of those things of creation become idolatrous for us, that they become the focus of our existence and we begin to define our identity in light of them rather than in light of the person of Christ and who we've become in him. We, we choose to prefer those things over God. And it brings a kind of deep unhappiness. And I'm glad the author brought that in here in the last paragraph, that there's a kind of a illusion, I think, found in the, the stimulation that comes through modern entertainment and technology. It seems to satisfy those desires, but it's a passing satisf satisfaction. And then after it passes, a person is left with a, a deeper kind uh, of emptiness. And so it perpetuates itself. There always has to be some form of greater entertainment, greater technological advance that captures the imagination. We become bored with self and life. And that's the, the worst kind of uh, unhappiness and a profound kind of dis-ease that, that exists within us where we should have this deepest kind of peace if we are focused upon God. We see our true dignity and destiny in him when the noose is purified and so know, should know the greatest joy and the greatest <coughs> happiness. This should be our fundamental attribute as Christian men and women, joy, joy <coughs> in, in the Lord. And so often if we don't know it, it's because we're immersed and attached to the things of the Lord. Any final comments or questions before we conclude for the evening? It's a great little text. Are you comfortable with approaching uh, the, the theme through it? I'd like to spend a, another week or so at least uh, with the theme of the news because it is so valuable and important. And they get into particulars in regards to how, how it functions within the spiritual life. Yes? What is the name of this text again? This text, it's called The News. <laughs> and uh, theme, Themes of the Philokalia. And so it's the number two. So it's the, the second book in the, the series. And again, it's uh, published through the Holy Monastery of St. Gregory Palamas. It was available online through Amazon, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding it. So why don't we close this evening? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Okay, thank you everyone.